acknowledge that our sovereignty was never ceded, no treaty was signed, and that it remains Aboriginal land. I'd like to pay my respects to Elders, past, present and future, and welcome especially any Indigenous people who are watching this. So I say um, welcome to episode one, like I have some kind of master plan, and I am absolutely making this up as I go along. Uh, so exactly how this will work will evolve in across the first few episodes at least, and I'm fine with that. But that means that I'm especially open to any thoughts, suggestions, and so on that any anyone might have. So feel free to get in touch if there's things you'd like me to do or or uh, change about the format. We can I can definitely think about that. Just not to say I don't have ideas. Um, 
I'm imagining this will be a once every week or two weeks sort of release. Uh, in every episode I will begin by playing a tune or a set of tunes, as I just have, and then spend some time talking about those tunes. And really what I want to focus on is this question of why I make the choices that I make in playing these tunes, and the related question of why other people might make different choices, including yourselves perhaps. Uh, I don't really want these to be uh, tutorial videos as such. I think, I hope you'll learn from them. I hope I will learn from them, but I, I don't really want to teach tunes. Um, instead, I'm sort of more interested in just um, having the conversations about what we do with tunes. Uh, what we do with this instrument, and so on. Um, so if you are new to Beal and Pipes or Irish traditional music, firstly, welcome, and I wish you all the best on your journey. But uh, for you to get the most out of these videos, I am sort of imagining you will have some understanding of things like uh, a cran and a roll, some triplets, um, we'll have a bit of, um, at least a, a developing repertoire, really. Um, there's plenty of value in, in um, more focused learning when you're getting familiar with the instrument and the repertoire, but I'm not really here to do that. I think that's much better done in a traditional one-to-one, -one, if at all possible, in-person basis with an experienced piper. Okay. Um, I guess I want to also talk about the title, why I've decided to call this The Piper in the Cave. Um, so it's the name of the tune, which you would have heard as the uh, introductory music. Um, and it's a tune I'll probably cover sooner rather than later in these episodes. But I guess I'm just struck by this symbolism of the cave as, as a place of retreat, of self-examination. Um, introspection. All things I think are really important to how, at least how I play this instrument and I think how a lot of people approach this instrument. Um, you know, caves are also, have prominent symbolism in a whole lot of mythologies and mystical traditions as places where one does encounter uh, deep truths, either about oneself or perhaps from a higher power. Um, and in fact, in the story, the, the Piper in the Cave, the story of the tune, um, it's, it's actually the last time we see the Piper is entering the cave. So, you know, that's not to say there's not, there's not dangers perhaps. Um, that's certainly not to say that we should spend all our time in these kind of caves. I, um, I think we really need to balance that with getting out and playing tunes, um, you know, the, the Dionysian to counter the Apollonian impulses, if you like that kind of language. Um, but I, I, I do, in these videos at least, basically just want to focus on these kind of questions of, of practice, of interpretation, of technique perhaps. And um, hopefully, you know, we, we all emerge from the cave a little a little wiser, a little stronger, certainly changed by our experiences. Uh, one final note perhaps is that I do intend to make this a subscription service. Um, I'll probably have two levels, one for if you just want to see the tunes um, and another for if you if you enjoy this kind of discussion as, you will, as I'm about to get into. Um, but the first few episodes will definitely be free, so just um, stay tuned for news on how exactly that will work, and please do get in touch if you have any thoughts or comments you'd like to share. Thank you. Okay, um, so we had three reels there. The first one, the old blackthorn stick, uh, then the blacksmith, and then the Dublin reel. 
the first one is sometimes also just called the black phone stick, which risks confusing it with at least two jigs of the same name, um, which is probably why the old black phone or the old black phone stick title came about to distinguish it. They're all um, fairly well-known tunes, I'd say. If if one of them is less known, it's the middle one, the blacksmith. But it's such a simple and repetitive tune um, that people can often kind of learn it or assemble it from pre-learned chunks on the spot after just one or two hearings. So I often throw this set out in sessions, um, including sessions where I'm a visitor and may not really know um, exactly what repertoire we have in common. And I find it a fairly safe bet. If you get to sessions with me, you've heard me play this set, probably. Um, why do I like to play these tunes together? I guess um, I think of them all as kind of old school tunes, by which I mean there's a, um, a certain directness to them and a certain, um, they all have a really appealing rhythmic lift, which I think is best served by a little bit of a swing and maybe not the fastest of fast tempos, though um, your opinion on that may of course vary. Um, certainly they're all, I'm gonna start again. Okay, we had three reels there. Uh, the old Blackthorn stick, the blacksmith and the Dublin reel. The first one's also just called the Blackthorn stick, uh, which risks confusing it with two jigs of the same name, at least two jigs, maybe there's more. Um, so which is probably how the old Blackthorn or the old Blackthorn stick title came about. Uh, they're all fairly well-known tunes. If you, if you get out to sessions with me, you've probably heard me play this set. And it's one that I will happily play at uh, sessions where I'm a visitor and don't necessarily know what repertoire we have in common. It tends to be a fairly safe bet. Um, they're all tunes that get out. If, if any of them are less well known, it's the blacksmith, the middle tune. But it's such a simple and repetitive tune that people can often learn it or you know assemble it from pre-learned material on the spot with just one or two hearings. Um, why do I play these tunes together? Um, a few reasons. I guess I think of all of them as sort of old school tunes in a way, by which I mean there's a certain directness to their, how they communicate, I suppose, and a certain, maybe even more importantly, a certain kind of rhythmic lift. Um, I feel they're all tunes that really you want to tap your foot to, you want to dance to, even if you don't know how to dance and I don't know how to dance, but they should have that feel. And I think that's best served by a little bit of a swing and a um, perhaps not the fastest of fast tempos, though of course your opinion on those may certainly vary. Um, the old Blackthorn stick, um, yeah, the only one that I'd say is really a piping tune is the Dublin Reel. Uh, the old Blackthorn Stick is certainly a well-known old tune. We've got recordings, uh, 78s by the Flanagan Brothers, by Michael Coleman. Uh, Joe Cooley also has a quite iconic recording of that tune. So, um, all quite well attested, but I can't really think of anyone much playing it on the pipes. But I think it's a lovely tune on the pipes, and it... It doesn't need a lot. Um, none of them really need a lot in a way. In terms of, you know, you could put a whole bunch of triplets, you could insert some crans um, in a few places, that sort of thing. But again, I, I feel that's kind of getting in the way. They should have just a, a direct appeal that's not like part of this esoteric piping world. Uh, the blacksmith, if anything, is probably less recorded than the others. I can think of a Buttons and Bows album it appears on. I'm not sure I can think of any others offhand. Uh, but in a way, you've heard it before because it's like a, it's like a piece of DNA, I guess. Um, it's so 
um, primitive, I guess, um, in the best possible way. You can kind of, it's a model for all these G major tunes. And um, therefore, you know, it's, it's kind of working underneath all these other tunes in a way. Um, and finally, the Dublin Reel, certainly, I would classify as a bit of piping repertoire. Um, probably call it piping repertoire, I guess. Um, Seamus Ennis and Willie Clancy both played it. Uh, Clancy played it in two keys, he thought D, as I've played it here, and down lower in C, which I won't really attempt um, now, but it's, it's quite lovely and quite different, lends itself to a much more of a, a flowing kind of approach than the more, um, a bit more staccato, um, bouncy sort of approach that I feel the D suggests on the chanter. Why do I play these as a set? Well, maybe I already asked that. Um, but yeah, I got as far as kind of talking about the rhythmic content, which I feel, I feel all these tunes are really first and foremost about transmitting a rhythmic feel. Uh, but there's a few other things, uh, speaking maybe more technically, they all start on a D. And I find that a useful device because it means that you can kind of uh, sneak in the change between tunes because it's it's only the second note of the tune that tells you when you've changed um, so that's sort of a, a useful linking device in my mind and there's just a little bit of um, melodic material which is just the notes E, G, F sharp, D, E I think oh I'm getting a leak from my Um, so that occurs in, well, it occurs in millions of tunes, um, but I particularly think of it in these tunes. So in the black thorn stick, uh, the old black thorn, second part. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, sorry. The, it doesn't have an E at the end, so it's just it, literally E, G, F sharp, D. But play that again. It is. Um, and then in the Dublin rail in the second part. There it is again. Again, nothing to particularly um, suggest that that's, you know, a, a key melodic cell or anything, just something that set up, sets up connection in my head at least. And I actually like to play that with a little triplet. E, F, G which can be either tight or open. Um, it's not like a classic piping triplet in a way, the GFE, the backwards version of that is, but it's easy enough and I think quite attractive to emphasize that. And when I'm doing it, I also like to do just a little, a little bounce going back to the F sharp. Um, which, yeah, I think just makes that little phrase stand out, and I do the same when I encounter it in the Dublin Rail. Um, great. So, I sort of want to isolate a few little more technical things I'm doing on the pipes. Uh, and, you know, there's plenty we could talk about, and I'm sure we'll get to that, but I kind of want to just focus on two, because otherwise I'll be here all day. So, um, there's a sort of more embellished role I like to do in the blacksmith. Um, and I think it works in that tune, because as I said, it's such a, a simple tune. By the time you've heard it once, um, the, the melodic structure of it is kind of already internalised. And um, that leaves open room for these kind of more, I guess, playing with texture and density in a way that might actually distract from the melodic flow if you're putting it into a more complex tune. Um, so essentially what I'm doing is putting an extra cut in a few different roles. So at the start of the second part of that tune, there's a G roll, and... Um, uh, So the first one 
as I played it then as a short roll. And then the second time, um, it has a G before it, which kind of makes it a long roll. But both in both cases, I like to play that top finger cut as well. So to slow that roll right down, we have... Um, so I'm doing both those cuts before the tap. And in context... Probably hear it there. Um, so it's just a little kind of... It's, it's textural as I see it, it's a little bit of bristle or something that kind of jumps out at you. Uh, and I do the same on a B roll in the first part. I use the C natural key for this. Uh, so, um, so that'd be it with just standard long rolls. And I put in a C natural cut actually at the end, so it's cut, tap, cut. Um, again, yeah, I wouldn't recommend you do that on all your B-rolls, um, but I, I find it an interesting little bit of kind of a little fluttering sort of effect, which is kind of cool here. And um, same things could apply to other rolls, so you could do that same top finger cut added to same F sharp roll, or the same um, C natural key cut on say an A roll. I'm not as good at that for some reason. Um, you could also theoretically use your thumb instead of the key. Um, I find the keys just a little more comfortable, but it would be much the same effect. Okay, so that's that for those sort of slightly embellished rolls. Uh, the other thing I really wanted to talk about, and I'll try not to take too long with this, but there's kind of a lot to say, is just how I'm approaching the regulators. And to an extent, I see this, this set of tunes as an excuse to explore some different kind of colours on the regulators. Um, <clears throat> I want to talk about how, how if you may or may not, it's fine, either way is fine, but uh, know something of, you know, um, chord theory, how that can help you in approaching the regulators, but also how it can really limit you um, if you don't use it kind of critically and know when to shut that impulse off. Because basically, I think if you're playing this music and you want to know what the chords are to the blacksmith or to the Dublin reel. Fundamentally, you miss the point um, that there's these tunes imply a whole range of possibilities in terms of what chords you can play, and that all these possibilities should be open to us, including you know um, you, you don't have to make a choice. Is I guess what I'm saying. You can explore these things as you play them. Um, and maybe especially on the blacksmith, because it's like, it's more a, such a simple tune, it's more a collection of riffs than like a clear melodic structure in a way. And that means the tune can almost become the accompaniment. And the thing that's varied and perhaps more interesting is actually what you're doing with the regulators. So you can kind of reverse the roles in a way. Um, okay, the regulators, um, your two most prominent chords are a G and a D here. You know, you've got a D here, G, D, G, different notes, but all serving those fundamental chords. And then a bit of an A minor is the most useful thing up here. Then you can play some little diagonal things too, we might get to them in a minute. But you don't have a lot of A. So the notes of an A chord, A, C sharp, and E, of those you only have A on the regulator keyboard. And a lot of tunes in D have really prominent moments where you might want to play an A chord. Um, 
second part of the black horn stick, say, so. So that second kind of cell is literally those notes I just said, A, C sharp, and E, and no other notes. Um, so really, if you were um, playing a chordal accompaniment on an instrument where you do have a clear A chord, that would be your first choice in most cases. Um, but if you're playing it on the regulators, you're playing your D chord, it can sort of feel a bit like the bottom drops out because you don't have such a full rich chord available. Um, so ways to kind of mitigate that effect um, one would be just to not play such a big D chord. So maybe you just want to hold an A note the whole way through. Um, that's really lovely, honestly. Um, another possibility is to actually play an A7 chord. So if you don't, um, if that doesn't mean anything to you, again, that's fine. Um, but it's just an A chord with an extra note added, which is a G in this case. And of course we have Gs on our regulators. Um, so if I play these two notes here, um, which is a diagonal shape, um, then we have something like this. And um, the thing about a seven chord is that it has a very clear uh, forward movement. It wants to resolve, that would be the terminology. In this case it wants to resolve to a D. So if you hear that, right, um, that means that that may be a terrible choice of chord if you're playing like a tune that is in A, um, because then it wouldn't want to logically move on to a D chord potentially, and that may actually sound quite odd. But in this case, these tunes are in D, it does want to go home to the D, and I think that's a really cool thing to incorporate. Um, but I also endorse, like, just trying some other possibilities. So why not a, a G and a D here? Um, so. <laughs> It has a bit of that same feel because you're still playing a G chord, uh, a G note, I should say. Um, but I think it's, yeah, it's a different feel and quite a lovely one. And it may not suggest itself to you if you're exclusively thinking, what's the right chord? Um, the right chord may not have a D in it, right chord, quote unquote. Um, but I think it's really lovely. So if you, if you're too focused on trying to analyse these tunes to work out a progression. Um, I think you miss these kind of opportunities to think more coloristically and um, less in terms of chord notes and more just in terms of degrees of um, shading and, and degrees of tension. Um, another great option would be a G and a D here. This, it has more tension again. I said a G and a D, but I mean a G and a B. And again, because that G is present, does have a bit of that desire to move back to the D, but certainly a nice option. Um, and I'll, I'll say a bit the same in the Dublin rail, so... Oh, sorry, I'm, I guess I'm thinking more in the second part, aren't I? So you've got um, a whole lot of A action here, and A would probably be where most accompaniments are accompanists would go in the second part of that tune. Again, um, you don't have that really clear A chord, so you've kind of got to make do a little bit. But I think all of these options we've looked at may have their place. Um, that really 
clear A7 chord there. And up. Or you could um, change it a, a bit midway. Um, lots of different options. Or again, you know, just holding that A note is often a really nice thing to do. In fact, if you want to explore possibilities um, for, for the regulators, I'd actually recommend just trying every single combination of notes you can easily reach and hold, and just holding those for the entire tune or until you've reached something you think is is wrong. So, you know, try this D and F over the whole Dublin rail. Second part. Second part. Um, kind of works. Maybe sounds a little unusual when you reach the second part. Try the same with this one. Um, I think that is gorgeous on the first part. And again, that may not kind of come to you as your first option when it so clearly states a, a D kind of harmony. You want to, the most obvious choice is but a D and a G. Can work beautifully over that whole first part. Essentially, I think what's happening there is you're kind of learning to hear the tune in G, not in D. Um, which is a really interesting thing to experience, especially if you've played it a couple of times playing the more conventional chord options or no chord options when the melody will suggest the conventional chord options. And um, maybe the third time or something. That quite unexpected but quite beautiful possibility. Another one that's a bit of fun is uh, so an F, and a, uh, F sharp and a B here will suggest a B minor kind of harmony over that first part. Um, again, I wouldn't do that every time, but it's a really quite unexpected and interesting thing to hear. So that's playing like a diagonal shape across the regulators and then moving to a more straight, straight on shape. Um, again, you know, depending on your setup, that may or may not be easy for you to reach. Um, certainly I find that one easier than the one going backwards. But feel free to explore with all those things. <coughs> so um, that's probably all I really wanted to talk about in terms of regulators here. But yeah, I'd love that exercise of just playing every chord at your disposal, or every, every single note even, at your disposal over a different tune. Um, you know, sometimes it's going to sound wrong right off the bat. Like I think if I play the blacksmith on an A and an F sharp. <laughs> kind of sounds like a mistake to me, but maybe it doesn't to you. Um, but you know, uh, maybe on a D and an F sharp it might be a different story. <laughs> Yeah, just try out all the possibilities. If you have a bit of chord theory at your disposal, for sure use that. Um, but don't just be confined to the way you would accompany something on a guitar or on a piano, because this is a fundamentally different setup. For one, you have this constant drone pitch, you have a different tuning system, 
there's a lot of things that make it kind of different and I think it deserves to be approached as its own instrument with its own set of, of limitations, sure, but also of possibilities. Great, uh, thanks for joining me today. Um, feel free to get in touch if there's other things I did or talked about that you'd like me to explore further down the track, we can do that for sure. And um, I'll see you next time, thank you.